Hello, and welcome to the candidate 2022. My name is Motun Rayo Alaka, and this is The Pondit Show. Today, we're taking a look at the new Nigeria People's Party and their candidate, Senator Mohamed Rabiu Musa Kwakwanso, and Bishop Isaac Odiri Idaosa. In the next 20 minutes, we'll be discussing their parties, their campaign, and their chances ahead of their sit down with Kaderia Ahmed. Here with me are Mr. Golan Olotede, a public affairs analyst and an economic. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. Next to him, we have Professor Ladi Adamu, a professor of mass communication, Amadou Bello University, Zaria. You're welcome, ma'am. Thank you very much. And finally, we have Mr. Emeka Madunagu, is a journalist and also a public affairs analyst. You're welcome. Thank you and good evening. So to dig in right away, we want to speak about what do you think that are the strengths of, the, of this candidate as a pair? Our Senator Kwakwanso, 56, Idahosa, 57, different background. Let's start with you, Mr. Golan Olofsidi. Okay. Um, I, I think there are a lot of citizens who are interested the two major religions, I mean, that, that is not my view, but two major religions being represented in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in the pair. So for that segment of the society, they will be happy that you have Senator Kwakwanso, who is Muslim, and you have Bishop Bidausa, who is Christian. Um, there's also the balance from North and the South, um, you know, which, I, which I think is, is something that could be said to engender unity within the system. Um, a, a few other things, the fact that uh, Mr. Kwakwanso is 66, uh, so that's someone, someone, someone that is still less than 70. I, I, don't, I don't think it can be regarded as young, but there are people who will say, at least he still has some good years ahead of him, and, and yeah. it appears very, hopefully. very, hopefully, mm -hmm. it appears very so I, I think some of those things uh, will work for him on the periphery. Uh, then the strength of his manifesto, uh, his own academic pedigree. He's, he's a PhD holder, you know, uh, and, and that is something quite impressive uh, within the context of the kind of presidential candidate that we want. People say we want a learned candidate. And these are uh, some of the strength that uh, uh, Rabi will be bringing to the table. So, Professor, what do, what do you think are the strengths of the candidate? As a pair? Well, apart from what he said, um, the two of them look strong physically. They don't have certificate issues. Uh, I mean, that is, nobody has come up to say, this man did not attend this and he's claiming this or that. When I mean physical, they walk and look normal. And it's a good mixture, northwest and South South. South South has been neglected for some time. So I think it makes a good match to have that. And then the manifesto of the party, uh, it's very good but needs improvement. That's my assessment of it. Mr. Madunagu, what do you have to say about the strengths of the candidates? Yeah, I think of all the, all the candidates, all the presidential candidates, I think Rabbi Musa Kwankwaso has the richest, I mean, the most varied experience. He's been in the legislature, was in the House of Representatives, he's been a governor in the executive, and he's been quite around in politics. Mm -hmm. And he's also had experience as a minister, minister of defense, and so he's been a senator. And so okay. he's been here and there, and He's actually, he actually was defeated. He's uh, suffered defeat, but came back some years later to trounce a strong um, sitting governor. I mean, that shows that definitely he understands the intricacies of politics. And then his, his manifesto is very interesting, even though I think the manifesto somehow dodged 
the bullet on certain touchy issues in the country. I mean, the, the manifesto just went very neatly over those issues without making some matter of fact okay. declarations. So since you're already on it, Yes. about the weaknesses now of mm -hmm. the candidate. Yes. Yes. So let's just start, continue with you and tell us more about these weaknesses. I have started with the manifesto. Yeah, talking about farmer, I, I saw farmer header clashes. What exactly is farmer header clashes? That's still, it's still a, a thorny issue. I mean, people want to actually get that defined. What do you mean by farmer header clashes? Is it that farmers look out for headers to kill them, to kill them, or headers look out for farmers to kill them? What exactly that, because it's not in all such cases that, you know, it's a clear cut mm. dispute between farmers and headers. Mm. And then, so that will need clarification. That will need sorting out. Because we know it's not just about that. It, it, that the issue has gone beyond just about some people in some remote places, I mean, uh, getting into clashes. Then the exchange re uh, regime. I, 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 I the, the, the argument has been that the regime, you know, having a multiple exchange rate regime favors certain, uh, 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 certain people, certain groups, and encourages corruption. It encourages round tripping. And he has said that he will deal with corruption. So when you leave an open-ended kind of exchange rate regime, you're not explicitly saying like some of the candidates that, you will ensure there's just one exchange rate, mm. but you are saying that you will develop an exchange rate regime that favors exports, mm. imports, and all of that. It's as if you are dancing here and there, because Nigerians want clear declarations about these things. Then talking about uh, the, the security, dealing with security, recruiting uh, 700, uh, uh, 1 million boosting the numbers to 1 million uh, in, the, in the armed forces and 1 million in the police. Well, of course, we know that over the years, you know, um, government, you know, successive administrations have recruited people, have been recruiting uh, people into the security services. But I think it's not just about the numbers. His manifesto talks more about the numbers. But what about current realities in, poli in policing, in security management. Mm. What about dealing with global realities yeah. about managing terrorism? I think these are things that need to be ironed out so that Nigerians can have a clearer idea. You know, but I see that his manifesto tries to take that populist path, you know, sort of you know, expressing empathy. Mm. I will be, it will be your government who will be with you. But you see, Nigerians have been used to all those kinds of promises. We'll help you, don't worry, your children will get a good education. We'll even bring free food and all of that. Yeah. But where has it left us? So, so just taking up from there, you know, uh, Mr. Martin Ago Prof has spoken about summer headers, mm -hmm. um, a manifesto that is there but not quite deep, mm. not so clear, um, the exchange with the security. Uh, what, do you, what other things do you think? Oh. I, I just want to add to the issue of security. That's the main problem in Nigeria right now. People can't move out. Mm -hmm. You get kidnapped. You are at home. You, you are kidnapped. You can't do anything. You sit in the office. You are afraid. Somebody wants to kidnap you. So um, the lapse I found there is that how is he going to secure Nigeria internally and externally? Mm -hmm. Internally, the issue of banditry, the issue of uh, all this uh, insurgency and all these other security challenges we're having, that borders on intern the internal aspect. These internal aspects also have links to external aspects, you know, who are the funders. How is he going to, you know, secure Nigeria from all these problems? It's not clearly spelled out in the manifesto. Then he talked about increasing, like he said, the number of, uh, right now we have like 135,000 army. Mm. Now he wants to raise it to 750, you said, and then to 1 million. 
he did not go out to mention clearly how he's going to go about that. And the police. The police also, we, you see, the Nigerian army is doing the job of the police in internal operation. So we have to, it goes beyond just increasing the number. The Nigerian police is not trained to handle upheavals. They were meant for ceremonial duties. We wow. have to go back to address these issues. Is he going to do that? Mr. Lajade, your take. Okay. Um, I, 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 we're, we're talking about the manifesto, so we're looking at it both from the positive and negative side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. On the positive side, I've read four or five manifestos. And on the positive side for uh, Dr. Kwakwans, he made a bullet point of the environment. Mm -hmm. And that is a strong positive. Yes. Now, for all the other ones I read, nobody thought about making the environment a, a strong bullet. Mm -hmm. point. And the problem with that is that if you don't pay attention to the environment, all those other things that you pay attention to could be destroyed in a, in a, in a, in a day mm -hmm. by the environment you didn't pay attention to. Whether you're talking of education, you are building roads, whatever you're doing, or you're you are funding farmers, or you're doing agriculture, all of them the environment could wipe it out in a short period. You know? So uh, I'll, I'll say kudos on that. Then he's particularly passionate about education. Yes. So, uh, uh, and I've seen that in the issues of, okay, we will we'll fund this, we will fund that. I, th I think one of the things he's trying to do is to drive education. You know, all these out of school uh, 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 children, children all over Nigeria and, mm. and all of that. So if you make it easier for people to want to attend school, if the education infrastructure is there, if the teachers are there, um, the funding is there, people will go to school. At, you know. However, I disagree with some of the issues he's raising about you know, how he wants to make that happen. Okay. So you see issues about uh, free exams and, and all of it. <laughs> you see, we have this culture that says... Um, when, when, when we are applying subsidies, subsidies should be targeted, and we need to look for structures that can target the right people that deserve subsidy. Mm. Don't, don't subsidize everybody, including people who can afford to pay. People who can afford to pay, let them pay. Mm. Let the society take care of people who cannot afford to pay. Otherwise, what we're going to do is that we will overburden the government with cost that it may not be able to sustain. Look, look, look at what has happened to the tertiary education in Nigeria. In 1972-73, when the first strike was said to have happened, um, it was still about welfare and funding. 50 years after 2022, mm. it is still about welfare, welfare. and funding. But so, if we're not careful, we, 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 we may be walking into something that we'll not be able to sustain with all these Free this, free that, free that. It is good to, subsidy is not evil, but subsidy must be properly targeted to ensure that you are not subsidizing everybody equally, including those who can afford it. Professor, I'm coming to you now, and I would like us to just talk very briefly about the popularity, the perceived popularity of this pair. How popular do you think that the pair of Papanso and Idarosa have? I don't know much about uh, the vice presidential candidate for NNPC, but I know that Pankoso in the north, is a, he himself is a movement. He has followership. He's very popular. But maybe that popularity is only in the northwest. I don't know about nationally. You okay. know, I don't know about that. But I think he is very popular in this areas I've just mentioned. Mr. So Mark Nago, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, uh, both um, the, the Pankwaso and uh, the Dahosa people I've known, I've followed for a long time. So, I mean, the Dahosa is um, a Pentecostal preacher in Lagos here. Yeah? used to follow his programs on TV. And then um, Pankwaso. But I think there's something about this Pankwasia movement. It's 
That's what I just to mentioned. be more of a northern thing. And then Kwame Kwaso has an issue in the south. He's perceived more to be someone who has who has invested himself in fighting more for northern interests against southern interests. Mm. I'll give you an example of the controversial removal of the former chairman of the National Population Commission, Dr. Festus Odimego, after he granted an interview to a national newspaper. I mean, Kwame Kwaso was accused of having put pressure on President Goodluck Jonathan to remove him because of certain comments he made in that interview. So these are things that, you see, people keep in one corner of their hearts waiting for election season to pull it out of the bag and say, you did this to me, I'll do this to you. So I think he, he needs to have a more national outlook, I mean, so that it, he will be seen as somebody who has a pan-Nigerian, who desires a pan-Nigerian mandate. Yes, he's, gross, he's immensely popular in the North, but some of the people supporting him, like Boba Galadima, have been talking more about the North. He will win in the North. He will win in the North. But we have 36 states and the FCT. So it's not just voting will not take place only in the North. It's going to take place all over. I so, think his popularity yeah. is more with the youth. You know, in Northern Nigeria? It, well, let me speak on the one that I know, yes, in the North. When I say he's a movement, he has followers that cuts across the whole North. Because I know some of my students would tell me, oh, I have to go for Confasia meeting in Kano. Please, <laughs> madam, excuse me. Many of them will come that they are going to Kano. So you can see some of these students are not only from the Northwest, but from the North itself. So he's very popular with the youth. And his running mate, I mean, he grew up in Mina. He started his church in Mina, mm. a Pentecostal, with a father that is revered across Nigeria, mm. Bishop, Archbishop Idaosa, mm. and you know that the sentiments that go, go with that, surely that, that brings something to the table. Yeah, what, do, what do you say, Mr. Definitely, definitely. definitely. Yeah, that brings a lot to the table, um, mm. especially among the Pentecostals. Uh, Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's something about the, the campaign or the candidate mm -hmm. that reminds me of the early years of um, presidential interest by the current president. Uh, there was a particular year that I remember it didn't even come to the South at all, the campaign. That mm -hmm. was President Buhari. And he still had maybe like 10 million votes or something mm -hmm. because he had That's those popularity in certain parts of the North. Mm -hmm. so, but you see, the lesson from the Buari case is that he may not be enough if popularity is limited to the north. Mm. When he was able to break better into the south, he won the presidency. I disagree yeah. with that. Okay. Okay. Do you know Please. why? Because Kano itself has the largest number of voters. In Nigeria. I think Lagos has overtaken that now. <laughs> and what we are talking about, if you can get Kano in the north, I think you don't need some other area. It's good. We're still saying the same thing. In those years, I was talking about Buari would take Kano, he would take Kaduna, he would take Katsina, the KKK. Those are the big <laughs> vote delivery machineries in the north. But until he was able to cut across more into the south and probably had a good foray into the southwest. That was when he actually won that match. So I'm not saying that uh, Dr. Kwakwanso is not popular. I see him being popular maybe in the cities. I saw the picture of his campaign in Lagos. Um, that was the day he came to Unifan in mm -hmm. Lagos. Yeah. And the crowd was monstrous. Mm. Youth, That's the reality. Yeah. Monstrous. But if he does that at, if it was National to be level. a will it be the same? Mm. Or if he was Ota? We live the same, or Elisha, or, or we live the same. That's what I have not seen, which is why I'm thinking the popularity in the South might be limited to some major city, but that is not where all the numbers come from. So there may be a lot more work, and there, there's, there's still time. There's be a lot more work to be done, especially with the hinterland. Yeah. So what, what are the questions that Nigerians should be asking? You know, just following the debate on social media, for instance, on the platforms, um, watching what is happening on the street. There's a lot of talk 
around religion, around ethnicity. And sometimes some of those things blind us from the real question. As what are we supposed to be asking the candidates? What questions do they ask? Professor Yohiga. Yes, because I'm a professor who's been out of class for eight months. <laughs> <laughs> How is he going to reposition the educational system in Nigeria? That's number one. Mm. Number two, how is he going to secure security internally and externally? Number three, poverty. How is he going to address the high level of poverty, particularly in the rural areas? That's mm. where, you know, the main problem is rural areas. Then finally, for me, number four, how is he going to address the issue of medical tourism? Mm -hmm. Medical tourism, education, poverty, security. What other questions should no, we I, be asking? I think it should be clear on, on the issue of subsidy. Mm. Yes, because the I didn't see it. I, he was talking more about investments, you know, building new, developing new fields. And all. What, what Nigerians want to hear? What's going to happen concerning subsidy in 2023? Yes. Mm. Yes. Because, you know, this, the current administration played around that, played around that until it now began to, the reality began to dawn on them that you couldn't play politics, continue to play politics with a subsidy. Then there's the issue of religion. You know, it's, it's, it's perceived as a religious fundamentally. Yes, but because when Even he chose... Even with the bishop for his No, no, when he, chose bishop, his... when he chose bishop Idausa, it was surprising. You know, that was like kind of a game changer. That, oh... Mm. That, there's this perception about him, but for him to have gone this way, maybe it's not exactly, he's not exactly that kind of a person. So he needs, you see, he needs to project himself more mm. as a pan-Nigerian candidate who is open to different interests, which the current president has not really done well in. Mm. Yes, I mean, he's, he's been accused of nepotism, he's been accused of certain things. So, he has to show, come out to make definite statement, definitive statement about certain issues, subsidy, religion. What will religion, will religion play a key role in his administration? Yeah. Now that, of course, you know, you're going to be hearing bishop, bishop, bishop as his running mate. Is it going to play a key role or is it going to be subsumed? If he wins, is it going to be subsumed? Then how is he going to Talk about deal with national unity. Mm. How is he going to make Nigerians? To, because to all intents and purposes, Nigerians generally are losing interest in Nigeria. A you lot hear? of happen. Do you mean in yeah. democracy? But, well, in Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> Not in Nigeria. Nigeria. <laughs> Mr. Lalja, they quickly, your take on, on, on that. Okay. What should we ask him? We should, we should ask him about the, his approach to the head of mm. I know that the four most party deliberately avoided picking on farmer, to head farmer issues because there are political and social cultural issues that are mixed up with mm. that matter. But every time I look at it, I also see a huge economic context. Mm. So I'm asking myself whether we should be running away from it or confronting it. It would be nice to get his take mm. on the head of farmer issue. Um, of course, subsidy, as we mentioned. I want to also ask him how he intends to finance all this, this free education, free exam, free mm. tertiary, free this. It would be nice to hear him out. For, for all you came, I have a solution to it. You know, so it, it would be nice to hear so, that. I mean, one yeah. more thing that we will quickly take up our takes on. What, what makes or breaks a pair of Tok and So and Ida Osa? What do you think can make them, you know, come out better than perception, or what do you think can really break, break this as the elections come through? Involvement of youth. That is paramount. Believe me, you'll be surprised. Mm. Youth. And that's his greatest uh, achievement. He has a way with youth. Okay. Any other thing from your hand? Um, well, maybe I was thinking also on how is he going to compensate women voters? You know, Yes, there are more women voters than men. And, and that's a huge topic, especially because, what, what I mean, no, no candidate uh, has uh, a female running mate anyway. How is he going to involve action. women? 
Okay, okay. In leadership, in leadership yeah. position. Quit it up. Yes. Yeah, what can actually make or break it? Going beyond just the fact that this is Pankwaso, a Muslim, this is Idahusa, a Christian. Mm. Because, yes, we saw it with Buhari, but Nigerians are asking, and so what? We've seen things. People have been killed, you know, mm. because of religion. You know, we've seen, so, so people are not really, such sort of things don't really resonate with Nigerians now. You know, this is, and so what? We want, Nigerians are asking, the issues. How are you going to put an end to, mm. for instance, fundamentalism? How are you going to put an end to violence, extremism, terrorism? Practically. Practically. What are the practical steps? Yes, he has said, you know, he will talk with everybody. He will talk with agitators, which is good. But beyond just talking with agitators, looking at the free education, it, 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 there's also the issue of the sense of entitlement mm. that comes with, you know, giving, giving the idea that, okay, we will bend over backwards. But how far will you bend over backwards, you know, for people whose agenda... Is just to destroy the nation. At what point will you say enough, enough, enough. is enough? That's so ridiculous. those are critical issues Nigerians want to hear. And then Nigerians want to be sure that you can travel from here to any part of the country and you'll be safe. If he can really get his finger on that, then Nigerians will say, all right, let's, stay, let's take this man seriously because he has the experience. Yes, Bishop Idaosa doesn't have that political experience, but he... Has a re I, I think he should even have, apart from, okay, maybe Atiku was vice, you know, vice president, mm -hmm. but of all of them, he has been here and there. So civil he has service, civil service, he's been legislature, he's been governor. So he yeah. has a rich experience. He should be, you know, he should be able to talk very clearly about yeah. issues. And he's also been a politician for such a long time. So it's not, it's not uh, learning the ropes, sort of, like uh, some of the presidential candidates. Okay. I, I think he should make um, a, a more use of the vice president candidates mm. um, because there are certain categories of, of voters, of voters mm. that that person will appeal to. Yes. And he should get him to go talk to those people and be able to break beyond the uh, uh, state capitals in the South mm. and reach those, those categories of voters. That would be something that would I can make him uh, even more popular as he is. Thank you so much. Um, so as is to set the stage, that's our time on the pundits today. Thank you. Lady, Professor, thank you so much for joining. Thank and you. gentlemen. Thanks for thank having you me. Much. You're still watching the candidates. Don't go anywhere because just after the break, Senator Rabiu Papanso and Bishop Isaac Idaosa will sit with Kaderi Ahmed for a deeper conversation. If you have questions for us, you can send them using the hashtag on your screen. Thank you. University of Ibadan, alma mater to great thespians, novelists, and politicians of the great nation of Nigeria. The University of Ibadan is located in Oyo State, southwest Nigeria. It was founded in 1948 and was one of many colleges within the University of London. Becoming an independent university in 1962, the University of Ibadan is the oldest degree-awarding institution in Nigeria. The University of Ibadan has contributed to the political, industrial, economic, and cultural development of Nigeria. Among this notable group are Nobel Prize winner Wale Shuinka, Chinua Achebe, a novelist and author of Things Fall Apart, Abdul Ghaniyu Abdul Razak, a lawyer and former president of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, and so many more.
Mayelsa is an oil-producing state in the south-south region of Nigeria. It was created in 1996 by the then military administration. Mayelsa has also produced prominent people such as Ben Murray Bruce, a businessman and senator, Dakori Ebusin Akonde, a Nigerian actress. She is an ambassador for Amnesty International, Timi Dakolo, musician and businessman, and so many more. Recently, Bayelsa has been seriously affected by the flooding situation that has plagued Nigeria. This has seen many lose their lives, properties and businesses. University of Abuja. The prestigious University of Abuja, nestled in the Federal Capital Territory in the north central part of Nigeria, was established in 1988 but officially started running in 1990. It was set up as a dual mode university with the mandate to run conventional and distance learning programs. The university offers diploma undergraduate and postgraduate degree programs. Popular persons who have graduated from this institution are Kanayo O Kanayo, actor, filmmaker and lawyer. Iman Suleiman Ibrahim, former Deputy General of NAPTIV. Muhammadu Bako III, a first class Emir of New Karshi in Nasarawa and many more. The University of Port Harcourt. The University of Port Harcourt is located in Chuba, in River State, in the South South geopolitical zone of Nigeria. It was established in 1975 but was given university status in 1977. The University of Port Harcourt was ranked the sixth in Africa and the first in Nigeria by Times Higher Education in 2015. This university has graduated several notable Nigerians who are spread across several industries. Some of these people are Rita Dominic, actress, Alex Oti, former managing director of Diamond Bank, and Rotimi Amechi, a former governor of River State. As it continues to run, it has promised to continue churning out great students year in and year out. Coal City University Enugu Named after the state's slogan, Coal City University is a not-for-profit private university nestled in Enugu State in the southeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Established in 2016 with 10 faculties to its name, Cold City University currently has over 800 students. The university prides itself on offering an excellent learning experience for students, informed by up-to-date research and facilitated by a high-quality learning environment with multimedia classrooms, ultra-modern laboratories and a modern library. Paul City University in Ugu, though young, organizes an annual essay contest for secondary school students in an effort to increase awareness of current global issues among the young population. University of Maiduguri, popularly known as Unimaid, a university located in Maiduguri, the capital of Borneo State, nestled in the northeastern part of Nigeria, created in 1975 by the federal government of Nigeria. Unimaid enrolls about 25,000 students across all programs. This prestigious university has seen notable persons such as Bala Mohammed a renowned minister and senator, Yamisi Akimbabola, 
a renowned journalist. Ahmed Lawan, the President of the Nigerian Senate, and so many other notable names. Bayero University Kano, initially called Amadu Bello College, this citadel of education was renamed Bayero University Kano. It was established in 1960 by the Northern Nigeria Ministry of Education. It is located in Kano State in northwestern Nigeria. Known for their great research work, Bayero University Kano Research Centers include the Center for Advanced Medical Research, the Center for Infectious Diseases, the African Center for Excellence in Population Health and Policy, the Center for Gender Studies, the Center for Dry Land Agriculture, the Center for Biotechnology Research, the Center for Renewable Energy, and so much more. Notable alumni of the university include Ahmed Adamu, Petroleum Economist, and lecturer Moses Uchonu, historian and author Ahmad Sani Yerima of Samfara State, and so many more. University of Ibadan, alma mater to great thespians, novelists, and politicians of the great nation of Nigeria. The University of Ibadan is located in Oyo State, southwest Nigeria. It was founded in 1948 and was one of many colleges within the University of London. Becoming an independent university in 1962, the University of Ibadan is the oldest degree awarding institution in Nigeria. The University of Ibadan has contributed to the political, industrial, economic and cultural development of Nigeria. Among this notable group are Nobel Prize winner Wale Shuinka, Chinua Achebe, a novelist and author of Things Fall Apart, Abdul Ghaniyu Abdul Razak, a lawyer and former president of the Nigerian Stock Exchange, and so many more. Bayelsa is an oil producing state in the south south region of Nigeria. It was created in 1996 by the then military administration. Bayelsa has also produced prominent people such as Ben Murray Bruce, a businessman and senator, Dakori Egbusin Akonde, a Nigerian actress. She is an ambassador for Amnesty International, Timi Dakolo, musician and businessman, and so many more. Recently, Bayelsa has been seriously affected by the flooding situation that has plagued Nigeria. This has seen many lose their lives, properties and businesses. The University of Abuja, the prestigious University of Abuja, Nestled in the Federal Capital Territory in the north central part of Nigeria, was established in 1988 but officially started running in 1990. It was set up as a dual mode university with the mandate to run conventional and distance learning programs. The university offers diploma, undergraduate, and postgraduate degree programs. Popular persons who have graduated from this institution are Kanayo O Kanayo, actor, filmmaker, and lawyer. 
Iman Suleiman Ibrahim, former Deputy General of NAPTIV. Muhammadu Bako III, a first class Emir of New Karshi in Nasarawa, and many more. Kadaira Ahmed is a leading Nigerian journalist and media entrepreneur. She sits on the Nigerian Board of Trustees in the International Press Institute and has been recognized as one of the five most influential people in Nigeria's media landscape. Kadaira is a recipient of grants in support of her work in accountability journalism from leading donor agencies, including the Ford Foundation, Osiwa, PLAC, and the MacArthur Foundation. She is the executive director of Daria Media, a company whose focus is public service journalism. She is also the managing director of Radio Now 95.3 FM, a radio station broadcasting out of Lagos. Radio Now exists to provide factual, unbiased and Nigeria-focused media products that empower citizens to hold power accountable, build social consciousness and promote nation building. Kadaira's passion for public service journalism is driven by a creed to confront inequality, injustice, and the pitfalls of identity politics. As a result, she has created, produced, and anchored programs through which she has set the agenda for national conversations on significant issues and, at times, influenced policy. She has written extensively and has been published in national and international newspapers, including The Daily Trust, the Guardian, Premium Times, and the Financial Times of London. She is a member of the Nigerian Guild of Editors and the Nigerian Institute of Directors. She started her career at the BBC in London. Kadaira has a master's in television from Goldsmiths, University of London, and a bachelor's degree from Bayero University, Kano. Good evening and welcome to the third in a series of six town halls that bring the major contenders for Nigeria's presidency face to face with the electorate that will decide who gets the top job. Again, I am Kadria Ahmed, your anchor this evening, and we are going to start today with the candidates of the new Nigeria People's Party, the NNPP. Alan Rabi Musa Konkoso is the senator for Kano Central Senatorial District. Born on October 21st, 1956, he's a trained engineer who works in the civil service of Kano State for 17 years until he went into active politics in 1992. He served as the governor of the state twice, from 1999 to 2003, and again from 2011 to 2015. Senator Konkoso also served as Nigeria's Minister of Defense during President Obasanjo's administration. Twice in the past, Senator Konkoso has tried and failed to win his party's ticket to contest for the presidency of Nigeria. First, under the All Progressive Congress in 2014, and in 2018, under the umbrella of the People's Democratic Party. On June 8th this year, Senator Rabi Musa Konkoso emerged as the presidential candidate of the new Nigeria People's Party at the party's presidential primary election, which was held at the Moshida Dwala Stadium in Abuja. Today, he offers himself for election as Nigeria's next president. His running mate is Bishop Isaac Idahosa, the presiding senior pastor of God First Ministry, popularly known as Illumination Assembly. A trained mechanical engineer, in 1979, he changed paths to join the Christian ministry 
and attended Soul Clear Bible College in 1985. Bishop Idahosa is a writer, inspirational speaker, and gospel artist with three albums to his credit. He is popularly called Prophet Toknadu by his admirers and was decorated by the Lagos State Government as one of the mayors of the Lagos State Traffic Management Agency last month. He has received the United Nations Peace Ambassadorial Award for his contributions to the growth of humanity and peaceful coexistence through evangelism and Pentecostalism. In mid-July this year, he was presented as the vice presidential candidate of the new Nigeria People's Party. That was the short profile of the two candidates representing the NNPP party. Um, Dr. Konkoso, thank you so much for saying yes. I'm confused, actually. I don't know whether to call you Dr. Konkoso or Senator Konkoso or His Excellency, former Governor Konkoso. Um, I see that uh, the bishop couldn't make it. I understand he's unavoidably absent. But we thank you for making the time. Now, before we begin, just a few things to note. Um, in <coughs> addition to people in the room who will be asking questions, of uh, the senator, we have six remote locations across six geopolitical zones. And over the next course of the next two hours, we will hear from all of them. We've also collated questions sent to us via email and our social media platforms. And we'll try and get answers to as many of them as possible from our candidates. It is very important that people asking questions state their names clearly and be mindful of time to ensure that we get as many people as possible to be part of this conversation. Thank you again for saying yes to our um, invitation. So let me basically start by saying that you've tried twice before to you know, be on the ballot paper to contest for the presidency. They say third time lucky, you are now on the ballot paper. So when elections take place in February, Nigerians will have the option of voting for you as president. Why should we vote for you as president? Maria, thank you very much. Um, let me start by thanking Almighty God for making it possible for us to be here. And also thank Nigerians for supporting us over the years. As you rightly pointed out, I was a civil servant in Kano for 17 years. And I left service in 1991 to join politics. And in 1992, I was elected not only a member of the House of Reps, but also elected as Deputy Speaker of the House of Reps during the SDP and the NRC days. And I was also in the Consular Conference of 1994-95, where we drafted the 1999 constitution, and by 1999, I was governor of Kano State under the PDP. And in 2003 to 2007, I was minister of defense, of course, advisor to President Wandapuru and Somalia. From there, in 2007, I was nominated or appointed the representative of the Northwest on the NDDC, where I found the place very uncomfortable for my humble self to be. Therefore, I decided to resign because I couldn't sit on a board with the sort of things that were happening there. Mm. In 2011, I became governor again in 2015. In 2015, 2019, I was uh, elected at the senator representing the Kano Central. And along the line in 2015, you rightly pointed out, I contested with uh, uh, the present president, uh, Muhammad Buhari, and I was lucky to become a second here in Lagos. So also I contested in 2019 in Court together with uh, others. And of course, uh, Atiku Abuakar won the primary election there. 
Uh, from then to now, we have been working very hard to ensure that Nigerians are given the opportunity to choose not only from the two parties that over the years dominated the political space in this country, but we decided to bring something new. And let me say at this point that in 1998, 99, when we were forming this party, our key goal at that time was the issue of kicking the military out, mm. which we successfully did. And it was then that we decided, I mean, we saw so many differences within ourselves, people who were at the extreme left, extreme right, and everybody in between were all in one political party. Mm. And we found it uh, very difficult to prohibit. And that was why in 2013 14, we thought of bringing a progressive party, better party than PDP. Which ended up being that, the APC. Um, that was when we formed the APC. And uh, I was the founding father of the APC. Of course, I was a governor that particular time. We only joined the party when we felt it was the time to do that. And um, I was a senator under the APC. And I had also the experience of the two parties so and my humble self so and I, I many have, others. I have to interrupt because in, in making your statement earlier, you kind of presented yourself today as providing an alternative to the APC, which is the ruling party, and the PDP. But in reality, people will just say, this is old wine in a new bottle. Because technically, you were, both, you were part and parcel of both the APC and the PDP in very substantial ways. So for Nigerians watching and listening to you, there's still people who are not going to be convinced that what you're offering is actually new or fresh or different. You see, like I told you, when we started the PDP, we had this issue of bringing everybody on board. To the extent that when I was governor, and even when I was minister under the PDP, we had so many issues to so many people in that party, and it was purely ideological differences. It has nothing to do with personal issues. And that was why in 2003, I had to lose election. But those who were together with me in that party could not believe, could not agree with what we are doing. So perhaps to this them, is the time you can tell us what your underlying philosophy and ideology is now as you prepare to elect and um, to contest for office. So if, if you are elected into office, what is the underlying philosophy? What will be the underlying philosophy of your government? What will be the, the underlying strategy, the underlying ideology? of your government, if elected? You see, our ideology has always been consistent, either in PDP or in APC, and even now. Ours is to see how we can make Nigeria a better place for everybody. While others, based on my personal experience, believe that uh, there are some selected ones that must be catered for. And that's where the main issue really was. When I was in Kano, when we were talking of water supply for the people of the city, of them on the other side were believing that that much water supply should be given and do their boreholes. Okay. and supply their families with water. Okay. When we are doing uh, electricity, yes. or roads, or health, or agriculture, it's the same sort of thinking. And that is why mm. this country, we find it very, very difficult to move 
forward. I will allow you to get into more details after this short break. Don't go away. Daria Media, in association with Cabal Entertainment, presents The Candidates, a presidential town hall meeting series where the presidential candidates of the six leading political parties tell us about their plans for the country. Join Kadaria Ahmed as she leads us into the world of these candidates from the 17th to the 23rd of November 2022. This very important program will be streamed on FRCN, Radio Now, DSTV, NTA, Facebook, YouTube and more. This is a town hall meeting you shouldn't miss. Tune in. Let's hear from the candidates. Candidates, a town hall series brought to you by Daria Media with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. And we are in conversation with the presidential candidate of the NNPP, uh, Dr. Rabiu Musa Konkoso. Before the break, sir, you were talking to us about your underlying philosophy, which you say is people centric and traditionally has always been people centric. So if I can bring you to where Nigeria is today, starting perhaps with the economy, um, how in practical terms, will your people focus translate in terms of what you're going to do to essentially deal with the major economic issues facing Nigeria today if you are elected as president? Yes. You see, if you look at the issue of economy from the practical point of view, there are two issues. Issue one is how to make money available into the treasury. Today, unfortunately, because of some obvious reasons, government at the center is finding it extremely difficult to get the maximum resources that should be in the treasury. Our main source of income in this country is oil. And today we are told that the 2.2 million barrels of oil allocated to Nigeria by OPEC cannot be achieved. In fact, uh, the figures that we have is below 1 million barrels per day. About a million. Let's say 1 million, yeah. which is less than 50% of what we should get. Right from there, you could see huge problem. Of course, that can be said about other areas where government is supposed to raise the maximum it can get into the treasury. So, if you, what now, will you do to solve the yes, problems I'm that coming, mean, yeah, because yeah, the theft, still on the economy. Before yeah. I go to what uh, I should do, is the issue of spending the money itself. Right. Government must keep its eyes on what goes out of the treasury. And the issue of corruption, and of course, other wastages that we see right from the presidency down to the civil servants, and of course, the contractors or contracts, and so on and so forth, must be checked and eyes must be on every naira that government is spending. In other words, we believe that there is a lot of wastage today in this country. And these are the two areas, what goes in and go, what goes out. And what we are going to do from the uh, aspect of what goes into the uh, treasury is to ensure that there is enough security in this country for all our assets, to ensure that nobody takes anything out of this country 
And that's why we thought of providing adequate security in terms of manpower, in terms of equipment, IT, and intelligence, and everything so, that is necessary to save our assets in this country so that we can have the maximum. But you, I'm sure you, you, you accept, Senator Konko, so that we're not hearing anything from you that we don't hear from other candidates saying that they are going to, they, they, everybody says these are the problems. And then the real problem is explaining to Nigerians how. What are you saying that is different from the 18 other candidates that are contesting for this office? In terms of, for example, if we take some of the issues you've talked about, let's take them one by one. You talked about the fact that our income um, from our main uh, export um, commodity oil is down. It's down as a result of theft, is down as a result of um, wastages. It's, it's, there's a whole myriad of reasons why it's down. So how will you solve that first problem of revenue? And is that the only revenue you'll be looking at? If you are going to diversify, what are you diversifying into? How are you diversifying? From which time to which time should we expect to see a difference in you know, um, the revenue of the federal government? So that's one. And then we can talk about security. Now, you see, I'm not sure, Kadria, if you know or saw our blueprint. We are completely different from others because we mentioned the issues, the problems in this country, and we came very clearly to tell Nigerians how we are going to bring solution to those problems. For example, on the issue of security, and as former Minister of Defense and former governor for eight years in Kano State and former member of the NDDC advisor to President on Darfur and Somalia crisis and so on and so forth, we came very clearly, we looked at the number of the military members of the armed forces that we have today. And it was very clear to us that the number is too small under our circumstance, under the number of people that we have today in this country, and of course the challenges. Mm. And that was why after making consultations with other experts, we felt that there was need to increase the number to less than 250 that we have today mm. to about 1 million, because we looked at the recommended uh, figure or ratio in terms of that, that's numbers a 70% of the armed increase you're talking about. Sorry? A 70% increase in personnel for, for our defense and our yes, about, security. Yes, about that. About that. Over 60%. Have you done uh, the increase. numbers of how much? Yes, let me this finish. Okay. We'll come to all those uh, things. So I hope uh, you will uh, look at our blueprint and I get have, the details. Actually. If you have, okay, fine and good, and I'm happy you, maybe you read it. And we even have some to give you and give to some other people to look at it. And so also the police. We feel the number of police today is much less than they should be. And that was why uh, from less than 230, we thought of making it about a million also. And of course, we are going to increase the other security agencies ranging from the uh, DSS to the civil defense, of course, to other areas that we feel that there is need for us to increase the number to ensure that within the shortest possible time, every square meter in this country is being taken over for Nigerians. Okay. Uh, unlike the situation today, where many people in many towns and villages have to be paying uh, to bandits and other criminals even to go, out, to, go to their farms. Okay. You know, this is not an interview. It's a town hall. I have a lot of people on standby. They want to ask questions. Sure. We'll get an opportunity perhaps to talk about the cost of some of your plans. But for now, I want to go straight to Enugu, who are on standby, so that they can ask the distinguished senator their questions. Enugu, good evening. Good evening from... The coal city, Enugu. I am a former Ajumumi. And 
questions are quite ready from the students. They've been listening attentively and they have something to ask the candidate. We've got two students on standby. We would have Valentine and Chisum. Valentine, let's hear you. Valentine Obelago from the Department of Microbiology. My question for you today is, according to Premium Times, Nigeria needs 365,000 doctors to fully manage and maintain the health sector, but we only have 24,000 available. If elected, how do you plan to manage the mass exodus of professionals? And what reforms would you put in place for all sectors? Thank you. Valentine is concerned about the health sector. What will our candidate do to, you know, reform the health systems? We also have Chisum on standby. Good evening. My name is Izzy Chisum. So Chisum is from the Department of International Relations. My question is, do you believe in restructuring or do you believe the current political structure of Nigeria is Okay, if yes, why? If no, what do you plan on doing about it? Thank, Thank you. you. That's the match we have from Enugu State, Nigeria. Thank you very much for that, those two questions. Enugu, um, how will you, you know, deal with the mass exodus of professionals like doctors that we're seeing? And do you believe in restructuring? If you do, what does restructuring mean to you? Thank you very much. Now, on the issue of health sector in this country like all other sectors. Actually, we have, been, we have not been getting it right. And that was why, for example, in Kano, we decided that we should not only produce doctors and other professionals in health sector for the state, but we thought that we had an opportunity to produce these professionals, not only for the North or Nigeria, but to produce even for international markets. And that was why uh, in the four years that I was governor at in the second term from 2011 to 2015, we decided to sponsor our students in almost all the institutions you can remember in this country and, of course, abroad. That was why, in four years, we were able to sponsor over 3,000 young men and women of Kano State uh, uh, people. When I say people, I mean residents, not indigenous over 3,000 in four years. Among them, we have many uh, people who are sponsored to go and study in various fields. I remember we had one set of 300 medical doctors going abroad at that time, and uh, only 45 were men. All the others among the 300 were female, and we did that uh, specifically to have people who are very much likely to stay in Kano and work for the state even when they didn't sign any bond to stay when they come back. I want you to respond, and also, yeah, before you go further, I want you to respond to, to, to something specifically because um, one of the, your most touted achievements, even among people who support you, is the um, scholarships that you're talking about. And yet, um, the sitting governor, of um, Kano State, uh, His Excellency Ganduje, claims that um, actually your much touted scholarship programs were a fraud. He's quoted in the Daily Trust as saying that you used contractors to gain admi admissions for people and administer scholarship, turning, and I quote, the whole admission exercise into a racket. He was reported as saying this according to the Daily Post. In 2006, the Kano State Acting Governor, Professor Hafiz Abubakar, alleged that about $28 million and over $6 billion was inherited by the Ganduji administration as debt in respect of foreign and local scholarships that you gave out. 
So I think you should respond to these two things, and then we can. Well, I thought on. I would finish with the, her question. Okay, sorry. But it's just see, that they are related. Yes, no problem. You see, ordinarily, I don't want to talk about uh, kind of state government. Right. For me, I have passed that level many, many years ago. I was governor in 1999, and uh, whoever is governor in Kano today can be seen to be very much my junior in the game. But in any case, don't forget, deputy governor... It's not governor, about him, it's about Nigerians. Just a second, please. Ganduji was my deputy governor from 1999 to 2003. He was my deputy governor in 2011 to 2015. And of course, he was my SE in Ministry of Defense when I was there. And um, I don't mind whatever I will say, but the fact of the matter is that Rabi Konkoso never borrowed one naira from any bank, from any individual, from anybody, either in this country or abroad. So I am one governor who has never borrowed. And in fact, I had anything borrowed. Not only that, in 1999, when I was elected as governor, I inherited a lot of debt, which I paid in four years. I lost the election in 2003. Eight years after, I came back and inherited another debt. In four years, I paid. I left Kano without borrowing one naira. So, so now, this, just this wasn't about Kadia, debt let me tell specifically. You. It was this about is... the scholarships. So maybe no, I didn't ask many question. I was asking. Okay. I have to answer one at a time. Okay, sir. If you are talking of scholarship, in fact, I paid to the last couple after the time I was living. In fact, our policy then was to pay scholarship, um, not only up to the, uh, that particular time, but to pay in, even in advance. But what we did was to even send our representatives across the world to find out how much we were to pay. But the point was that uh, there were courses that were not completed at that particular time, which is natural. Even you and me who would want to send your style to local university or international university or out of the country, you pay session, and we paid after that. No university was owing, I mean, we are not owing any university, when any one naira. Okay. Forget about whatever So these are opponent, just allegations. The opponent can say anything, enemy can say anything, so it does not matter. But okay. uh, what I say, if anybody has got any proof to prove otherwise, that will be fine and good. But okay. the fact of the matter is, we have not borrowed anybody uh, and uh, if there is any debt, anybody is paying Kano state government, which, of course, we are not in the same party, they should direct the person to me. Mm -hmm. As a person, I'll be happy to pay them. So let's go back to the students who asked you questions. If you could conclude on the issue around how you sort out mass exodus and also the restructuring of Nigeria. Yes. Those were the two other questions. Okay. Now, you see, our master plan in Kano and by extension in this country, is to produce all these professions. And it's possible. And it's doable. We have the resources. I always tell Nigerians now, as I was telling the people of Kano, that in this country we have a, enough resources to take care of. If only you have good leadership at those levels. We have proved it in Kano. All what we have done over the last the eight years I was governor, we used the resources 100% uh, in Kano. So, and that is our plan. Even though at the national level we have issues now, we are told that uh, um, what, we, what we are getting today is not even enough to service the debt, which is a special circumstance. Mm -hmm. And I believe we will come to that. But the point is that uh, not only in the area of health, not in the area of infrastructure and so on. I believe we have the capacity to produce enough manpower for our needs in this country and, of course, even for export. But initially, we will encourage our young men and women in diaspora to come back 
we will create a conducive atmosphere. I was in the so UK. So that's sort of the short-term plan. I was in the UK myself back. for about right. 10 years. Uh -huh. I know nobody outside this country, a Nigerian, for that, who is living anywhere in this world, will claim to be his comfortable. I was not comfortable when I was there. The weather is enough to worry you and so many other things. Even the money, I can tell you, the money that they claim to be paying or receiving, they give you right hand they take by left in terms of taxes and so on. We have many friends, many brothers and sisters abroad who have been there for many decades, but many of them have very little to show. So I believe that uh, we are interested as government for them to come back. We will also give them a conducive atmosphere, and that is what is lacking today. In fact, our system, even in the what area of health, what does a conducive atmosphere look yes. like, and how you will see, you let build? Let me tell it? you. Let us start from producing the professional themselves. What we have today in all the areas, mm. if you look at health, for example, you graduate from a university in Nigeria or elsewhere, you come back. Even to go for housemanship, huge problem. Slots are allocated. In, when I was governor, I was made to understand that the maximum any nursing school can, can, can be allocated by the nursing council was 100. Mm. For that reason, I had to build more than two universities, I mean two institutes. That's uh, nursing schools we built two. Uh, so also we built two um, midwifery and of course one uh, health technology. Okay. Now, the point is that uh, some of those bottlenecks must be addressed. I have gone to universities abroad where we have hundreds of doctors. I will impart maybe a thousand, but I am sure, I don't know of today, all these universities, even premier university like Bayero University, they will allocate 100 to them. Okay, why 100? Why not 200? Why not 300? Okay, what are the facilities? What do you need for us to produce 1,000 doctors in Canada? And I think you so are now... Now, with, that's the um, issue of production. Yes. Now, the issue, you see, we live in a small world today. Okay. If you are not too competitive, you cannot tie anybody's leg to say you have to stay here. Now, what we will do, like you said, we look at the issues that are making them to get out of this country while we are producing as many as possible. Now, once we sort out the problems, I can tell you from my practical experience, most of them will come back home. There is no place like home. We okay. all know that. And, and, and I think um, when you finish answering the question on restructuring, we will come back to this because there are one or two solutions you've suggested, including in the area of um, dealing with insecurity that require a degree of spending. And I want us to dive a little bit deeper into where you think you'll find the money, given the difficulty the country is in. But the, the question on restructuring, I think, is an important one. Yes. Do you believe in restructuring? If you do, what does restructuring you actually see, mean to you? I believe in restructuring. I believe in ensuring that we go through so many reforms, so many changes, the system is not working today, and this system must work not only for few, it must work for most Nigerians, if not all the Nigerians. You see, the issue of restructuring, whatever that means, because it no, you, means you, what does it very mean to different you? to so it, many people. Yeah, but to listen, you. you see, look, I will tell you, when I was in the consular conference, there were so many people who were hell-bent on changing from the presidential system of government to parliamentary system of government. And that was a very fundamental structure at that particular time. But of course, they were few. And therefore, we opted and recommended that we should continue with the presidential system of government. Now, in recent days, in recent years, so many people were talking 
about additional states, people were talking of additional local governments. Some even felt local governments uh, as they are constituted today, they are not needed. You know, so many opinions and even issues of state police and so on. They all Resource fall control. in the part of uh, uh, restructuring as they see it. But let me tell you, in my own opinion, you see, we have system failure. Now, this failure translates into people looking around to pinpoint why we found ourselves where we are today. Mm -hmm. To the extent that people are making many suggestions, including, the, for example, in the security. We have big issue in the security, everybody knows in this country. So people are saying, okay, the best way is to have state policy. Now, if we had peace, I mean, nobody would start thinking of alternative. But, but what we, we are saying mm. as NNPP is that we are going to provide adequate security for each and every Nigerian. Because we believe without security, you cannot do anything. The economy will continue to collapse. So no state they, police for NNPP. That's what we are saying. And we say we are open. You see, security, even Mr. President, cannot go into his bedroom and come out tomorrow and announce that uh, because he believes in having state police, that we are going to have state police today or tomorrow. Okay. It has to follow due process. Okay. What we are saying in NNPP, if it is the wish of Nigerians, to have state police, so be it. How will you know? Are you intending to call some sort of conference? What, what, I mean, how are you now, going to know what Now, I'll tell you what I wants? intend to do first. Okay. Okay. I have my own ideas. So that's the idea, collective idea of the NN. Is that the number of the police in this country, we are going to increase it. We are going to dominate every square meter in this country. We have to bring peace. Now, if we have peace all over the country, and if some people are still saying they still want police, uh, state police or local government police or whatever police, then we look at it. But our agenda captured the issue of state police in the area of restructuring. We are not against it. But as I told you, because of the failure in terms of security today, everybody, every professional is bringing one suggestion or the other to sort out the issue of security. And, you know, you can't blame anybody. The way things are going, mm. unfortunately, I mean, people, you have to talk about it, especially in northern part of the country, uh, especially in the area of Kaduna, Bernungwari area, in Zampara, in Kebbi, in Sokoto, of course, in uh, Kasina, even in Kano, in, in yeah. many other places. So all these things must be put on the table. We are politicians. We are Democrats. We are going to listen to the people. What they say, we listen to them. Okay. Those who are... Let me... You saw me carrying my phone. I'm not very good with numbers. So I was doing some little calculation. The current personnel cost of the Nigerian police <coughs> is about $712 billion. If we increase police to about a million policemen, which is sort of part of your proposal. You're looking at a salary structure of about two trillion per annum. And so it brings me back to the conversation I've been wanting to have, which is essentially trying to get a sense from you of how you think you're going to pay for all these reforms that you are trying to do. And, and I say this because from the first day you enter government, first of all, you're inheriting a budget that has a huge deficit. You're going to you know, inherit a lot of debt. Um, external reserves that are at all time low. And I'm looking around, we're not necessarily like we agreed productive. We are import based. So everything that we consume, we actually have to find not Naira, somebody else's currency and bring it in. And so from day one, you are confronted with essentially issues around financing. A few of your plans, I've listened very carefully, entail a degree of spending. How are you going to deal with that conundrum? Now, you see, 
while you are doing that arithmetic, yes, I sir. want you also to do this arithmetic in terms of oil that we are losing on a daily basis. From 2.2 million barrels per day, now, according to you, it's about 1 million. So 1.2 million barrels of day times uh, 365, or if you like monthly, times 30, uh, and so on and so forth, times the dollars. But that's assuming from day one you are going to No, you see, day holes. one, I will tell you. You see, our creditors are, I believe, sensible. You sit down together with them. Discuss this issue. Put it on the table. You have to survive. The country has to move forward. Because we are owing, it does not mean that we have to die that day. We will sit down, negotiate with our own creditors, and explain to them, tell them, and you can, I can assure you, uh, even before you tell them, uh, once they know it's a responsible government, they will listen. So we have to reschedule many things. We have to sit down and agree on many things. They want to get their money. Yes, we'll pay, but the fact of the matter is we have to be alive before we pay them. Mm. So we will sit down and negotiate the debts, uh, reschedule, agree on whatever is necessary, and then we move forward. And these monies, you see, from my own experience in the kind of state, I told you I never borrowed. Mm. And I believe that the resources the federal government is having with good management of resources, it is going to be good enough for each and every one of us in this okay. country. I'm going to open up the conversation. I think I've uh, dominated uh, asking of the questions for too long. So, uh, studio audience, anybody with questions, raise your hand. We'll get the mic. Please say your name. Keep the question short. And we'll take about three. Come back to him so that they're not too much. When he has answered, we'll then go back and do another three. Okay, sir. Please go ahead. Your Excellency, good evening. My name is Al Mukhtar Adamu. My question is uh, on economy, Your Excellency, sir. That is our Naira uh, two currency system that we have now Naira dollar system in Nigeria, where the CBN introduces flexible exchange rate. That is, the the PTA, DTA rate is different with the BDC rate and it's also different with the form M rate where they are sending it abroad. Your Excellency, the, S the flexible exchange rate of which stand as this week of 420 naira per dollar and the black market about 780 as at yesterday, Friday. How will you balance between the official <coughs> and black market rate? Which uh, the, margin, the margin according to the CBN should not be more than 3%. If the dollar is 420 naira at the official rate, so the market rate is supposed to be uh, 423 naira. That is 3 naira different. But now Nigerians are buying dollars almost 800 naira. And everything is you, you keeping... You need to ask your question, please. Okay? Yeah, the question, please. if you elected as a president, how will you tackle this flexible exchange rate Thank of you. the CVN? Okay, and, and I have to allow him to answer that because Thank I need to go much. to break after this, then we'll come back to the audience. Now, you will see, you flow to the Naira? Uh, Gadria, you see, this issue of dollar, there are so many things in And the government must do a lot in so many sectors and areas. I remember when I was living in this country, end of 1981, early, eight, my um, traveling allowance, I still have it, is 1 to 0.85 a dollar. Point, uh, sorry, 0.85 naira equals to $1. Dollar. Now we are talking of this 780. In fact, some few weeks ago, it's even more than that. Now, a lot, we made so many mistakes, and those mistakes must be corrected if we have to get it right. Now, the issue of security, 
very critical. If, for example, nobody goes out to, to the farm, nobody goes there to the factory, nobody goes there to buy and sell and so on, huge problem. If you don't have electricity to produce goods and services, huge problem. If you don't have the required manpower to handle your factories, industries, and so on, another huge problem. So, so there are so issues. many things that the government must do. You have to provide infrastructure, um, infrastructure as soon as you can. You have to provide security as soon as you can. You have to encourage young men and women to go to schools uh, uh, across the country. And that was why in our blueprint, we said the first thing we are going to do was to build 500,000 classrooms for about 20 million out of school children. Because I have to go to break, I need to just ask so, you, will you encourage the CBN to continue with the current policy? Now let me tell you, you see some of these things, mm. we in government, for example, we know our responsibility. Central Bank, Ministry of Finance, we know their responsibility, monetary and so on. Uh, uh, they will handle it as their own as professionals in that area. So what I'm saying is, it's not a, a matter, I mean, you have to get a way of merging this because we have seen a situation where you sell at 420, somebody will buy from you, he or she will cross the road and sell at 780. That will not be acceptable. Mm. You have to get a way of synergy, of bringing them uh, together. And that, I can tell you, is not just by mouth. It has to be practical. You have to do all what it takes by the government, especially the issue of corruption itself. Somebody who is will, today, he himself will get one billion. You go and buy a dollar at all, whatever it is, you will buy. Okay, so let me, let me take a quick break. And when we come back, we will go to the remote sites because they are eagerly waiting to jump into this conversation and ask questions. You are watching the candidate coming to you live on the Nigeria Television Authority and other partner stations, and also the radio services of the FRC. And I am in conversation along with other Nigerians with the presidential candidate of the NNPP, um, Prof. Dr. Senator Rabi Musa. So don't go away. Dario Media, in association with Cabal Entertainment, presents The Candidates, a presidential town hall media series where the presidential candidates of the six leading political parties tell us about their plans for the country. Join Kadaria Ahmed as she leads us into the world of these candidates from the 17th to the 23rd of November 2022. This very important program will be streamed on FRCN, Radio Now, DSTV, NTA, Facebook, YouTube, and more. This is a town hall meeting you shouldn't miss. Tune in. Let's hear from the candidates. Choosing where to study is one of the biggest decisions you will make in life. So, it is important to get it right. At Kohl City University in Ugu, Nigeria, we pride ourselves on providing students a stable academic calendar and education of international standards. Cole City University gives students incredible personal attention and support. You can enroll in our regular programs and obtain a degree exclusively awarded by Cole City University. Alternatively, you can enroll in our International Pathway programs, which will enable you to earn two degrees in four years from Cole City University and Delaware State University, United States. Visit www.ccu.edu.ng. Cole City University, education for self-actualization. Welcome back. You are watching The Candidates, a Daria Media Town Hall series brought to you with the support of the MacArthur Foundation 
and in partnership with the Nigeria Television Authority, Cable Entertainment, Zikoko Citizen, Silverbird Television, FRCN, Radio Now, Trust TV, New Central Television, Injenje Media TV, Captain TV. Now let us go straight to Bayero University, Kano, where Stephen is on standby alongside other students. Hello, Kano. Hello, good evening. Welcome to Bayero University, Kano. My name is Stephen Enoch. Firstly, I want to say happy International Men's Day to all men in the world. We have Spiff, Jessica, and Mariam Hamza who are ready to ask their questions. Let's start with Spiff, Jessica. All right. Good evening. My name is Jessica Spiff, uh, level four international relations student, and this is my question. My question is regarding the economy and as we all know, Nigeria is actually suffering a big blow in which about 70% of the country's income is going into the country's debt service and the remaining 30% going back into the system. So I want to know now what are the practical solutions that the candidate is going to put in place because he said earlier that he's not one to go into borrowing. So what are the other practical solutions you are going to guarantee us as Nigerians that you're going to raise the country's GDP and as well make sure that we, the youth of the country, are going to also um, benefit from this economic survey. Thank you. Up next is Mariam Hamza. Good evening. My name is Mariam Omotola Hamza. And my question goes thus. The education sector has been neglected over time in terms of budget allocation. Only five to nine percent to education, whereas UNESCO's minimum recommendation is that 25 percent of the national budget be, be allocated to the education sector. As a concerned Nigerian student, I want to know how the candidate intends to fund the education sector to bring back its lost glory. Thank you. Okay, um, so... Are, are you sure they are from Kano? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't they, think they are from Kano. These Kano. are Bayer University see, I can, Yes, from Bayer University. Yes. You see, those in Kano, in my opinion, shouldn't be in a hurry to ask those. Right. Why? Yes, because ideally they should know the world we operated in. <laughs> you see, maybe what these ones are invested, too young. Yeah, but maybe they just want other Nigerians to, to know. Yeah. You see, what we invested in Kano was more than the recommended 25%. Right. In fact, recently I was asked a similar question when we had uh, Channel's uh, uh, town hall meeting. And I had to go and check and put all the figures together. We did over that, over 25% during my time as governor. And what we have today in our blueprint, if we have an opportunity to uh, implement them, definitely it will be more than 25% of the national budget. And that was my own uh, uh, estimation. Do you think part of the problem why perhaps they may not remember is because your legacy hasn't endured? And if it well, hasn't, maybe, what do you think is the problem? I don't want to go into that. You see, if you go into government, what you will do is to ensure your success from day one up to the last day. What happens behind you, you have little or no control uh, mm -hmm. of that. Right. And I don't think anybody will hold you responsible. Now, let me say that um, the education is key to us. In fact, uh, before now, in Kano, if you ask us, our uh, priority number one is education, two education, three is education. But now the situation on the ground, on the aspect of security, we realize that uh, if we don't have the security, even to go to school will be very difficult. In fact, we have seen cases in many states, especially in Northeast, where so many schools were vandalized, were burnt down, so many students were picked, and so on and so forth. So security is key. Government, our government will go uh, to any length to 
to ensure peace in the country because that's where we have good economy, good education, good this, good that uh, in the country. So um, I want them to be rest assured that uh, if they look at our record uh, in Kano, we, yeah, we I'm sure we have more than 25% of our budget going into education. And I believe that uh, we are going to put a lot of money in education. In fact, that was why we said that even the jump fee, Wayek, Neko, nobody, no child will be denied going to the next level of education because he, Globally, child, she yeah, let, let me ask has you no something. money to pay. Yeah, globally, education is changing um, because of the nature of um, the world, you know, because we, we're in a tech world and the way people are getting educated is shifting. Not everybody now goes to a classroom, for example, to sit, to pass exams. Are you in any way, shape or form thinking about reimagining education or for you? What exists currently is good enough and it just has to be funded properly and has to be run properly. You see, education has to be funded. Education is key. And that was why, for example, in Kano, I'm happy they are listening to us. No child of school age was denied going to school in Kano. That was why we built thousands of classrooms. That's why we provided thousands of furniture. We provided uh, uh, um, offices, workshops. We built hundreds of secondary schools. We built 44 technical schools. We built schools for Islamic studies. And that was why we even had law to prohibit anybody sending his child elsewhere. If you want Islamic education, Western education, this is the school and so on and so forth. And that was why we sent our children, I told you over 3,000 in four years, to 14 countries across the world. And that was why we even selected private universities in this country. You and realize that when those, you left as governor, there were 1.5 million out of school children in Kano. That's today. No, I'm saying when no, you left in 2015. I'm telling like, you. Just tell them, I hope whoever is listening, should come with his figures. I am telling you the figures are 1.5 million. I mean, they're worse now, but when you left, there were 1.5 million what I'm children. I am out saying of it's not true. Okay. Maybe they left Kano, maybe they were not in Kano, but I can and tell they came you back we after prohibited. You left. Let me tell you, I was the governor. But any, if anybody, either local or international, has got anything to the contrary, where he is free. But what I'm saying to you is that during our time, we built enough classes. For every child going to primary schools, we built enough uh, secondary schools, hundreds of secondary schools, including technical schools, and so on and so forth. And we provided uh, tertiary level education to everybody to the extent that the two universities I established in 2001, that is Kano University. And is that Central same Technology. recipe? Just one second, please. Let yes. me conclude this. And 2000. And uh, at 12, that's Northwest University. We are not even having enough. We had to be making announcements and announcements for anybody with university qualification to go and get admission. As far as we are concerned in government, we can comfortably say that we did everything possible to bring Kano, not Kano indigenous, but Kano residents to go to schools. Now, if somebody was hiding somewhere, or somebody is doing his own uh, study somewhere and it's came with one fault. million, then okay. that's, that's it. In fact, let me tell you, for the eight years I was governor, we were feeding our children lunch. Okay. Let, for let the me, four let years me I was governor, remote... eight years I was governor, let me yes. conclude. Yes, sir. We were even two sets of uniform. Do you know why? Is to encourage them to come. Okay. It's not like there were too many, but we are telling them, please come to school. And then if somebody comes with this... Uh, these so, are the international numbers. Well, they could, be international. Who, who keep, they could I, be international. I, I don't want to drag this with you. Yes. So let's, let's go, quickly go to Ibadan, where Nero is on standby. Hello, Nero from Lagos. Hello, Kadria. How are you doing? I'm good. Okay. Thank you. 
Let's go straight. Uh, we are here live at the University of Ibadan, and of course, uh, we're at the uh, Communications and Language Arts Department, where we have the students gathered here listening with rapt attention. And we have two questions from two uh, students right here. We'll start off with the lady, and first up is Ediomo. Ediomo, let's have your question. Good evening, sir. My name is Akpani Ediomo, student of CLA, University of Ibadan. So I have two questions for you today. As a man who's <laughs> Position since 1992, that's the 30 years. How can you say what can you say you've done remarkably that can convince us enough to? Okay, we seem to have lost her there. Um, are we like to... and secondly, in regard okay. to pick and help Nigerians? Okay, I, I believe you heard the first question, and um, our questions that let's go Good. straight to the uh, next person. And that's uh, talking about... Uh, Actually, Nira, um, could you recap that question, please? Because we lost her there for a bit. Oh, okay. Adiomo, go ahead and recap your question. Okay. I said my first question is, as a man who's held many political positions since 1992, that is 30 years, what can you say you've done 30 years that is convincing enough for us to take you as a president? And secondly, in regards to your scholarship, how do you intend to broaden it in order to reach more Nigerians and help them? Okay, I believe that uh, that question, I hope it's clear this time. And also, we have Theodore here, and Theodore will also be asking his own question. Okay, good evening, sir. Um, I have two questions. So, in, in relationship with the federal character, I know there's a provision that allows for um, leadership that spreads across the geopolitical zones. And in the last 24 years, if I'm correct, we've had a um, 12-year leadership from the northern um, region. So my question in regards to that is, do you think that your ambition as a president does not defy the interests of federal character, like at least so that there will be equity in, in the tenure of leadership? Then secondly, in an interview, I don't know, I can't remember clearly whether it was on Arise or Channels TV, you made a comment that um, the Igbos are bottom feeders in democracy. So, do you not think that that statement would affect the number of votes you might get in the long run if you really would be aiming to get them at least 25% in all these states? Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. You had the four questions. Okay, thank you very much. You see, this first question, there are too many things to say. And I don't think even the two hours are enough to <laughs> tell her or him why I feel I am different. It's how, it's in where fact, we my started, strength, isn't I will it? tell you. Uh, my strength is the 30 years she mentioned. In fact, mean? it's my strength in the 30 years to be, in the the system, okay. to be in the system and be almost everywhere. But by the grace of God, today I am one of the credible people in this country. Very important. So you think that's an achievement that you've been in the system and still credible? Not everybody can go. Even many of them, one opportunity, they will solve their fingers. And that's the end of it. They can't even show their faces anywhere. So these 30 years has given me opportunity to learn so many things. In fact, if I had opportunity in 2007, like my brother, late Umar Eradua, I wouldn't have done what I believe I can do today. Because between that time and this time, I have learned so much about leadership in this country. And that was why, when I was governor 1999-2011, I left for eight years and came back second term, 2011-2015. Everybody now is remembering the second, the second term, much more than the first term. But you realize we're dealing with an electorate that is fairly young. A lot of them spread across Nigeria, and some would argue um, knowledge of you is limited in the southwest, in the south south, in the southeast. You're not as popular, many would argue, around this part as you are in the north. And so you can understand why young people who are sort of just coming up, new voters, all of that, are asking this question. And, and, and does that pose a challenge actually for you and your, for can, your candidacy, given the fact that primarily people think of you as being very strong in the north? but fairly unknown now, in the South. You see, we always tell our friends that just don't meet somebody in the airport or somewhere on the road 
and pass judgment on you. Go home and find out. If you go to Kano now, they will tell you who is Rabbi Kokos. Yes, but people Based of on Lagos the can't just, go just to Just one second. Mm. Now, this knowledge goes with geography. This knowledge goes with many other things. And that was why the idea of having opportunity to be in so many places, to, have in, to be in contact with so many people. My friends, my colleagues who are in the NDDC, my friends and brothers who are in the National Assembly, in fact, just recently, we celebrated our 30 years since we were elected into the House of Representatives. So the point is that uh, we have the opportunity to go around in this country, to make friends, to make contact. And that was why when we brought out this party, the NNPP, within a very short period of time, so many Nigerians joined the party not because of the letters of the NNPP. No, because of the credibility of Rabi Konkoso, because of the credibility of the board chairman, because of the credibility of the leadership of our party from the national to the words, and so on and so forth. And so that I'm was why it report. went like wildfire. Okay, and and now we have the structures in all the words, in all the local governments, in all the states, and zones and the national level. And it is because of those 30 years you mentioned that today our party is number one party. I, Even, I, 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 I will tell you, <laughs> let me tell okay, you. Okay, no, no, Kazea, it's just that I, the what, bishop is here. No, I will tell you. And I'm trying to see if we can bring him on as quickly as possible so oh. that your running mate. No, he will come. He's there. Don't... He's always there. <laughs> yeah, so he's we will he's take, for an assignment. We'll we will take a short break because he's around. I want to bring him on stage. And because my directors are telling me we will take a short break, then when we come back, you will take the other questions that were asked about your comments about the the Igbos, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't forgotten. We will give you that opportunity to respond, I promise. Um, don't go away. Join us in a minute. <coughs> You're watching The Candidate. Daria Media, in association with Cabal Entertainment, presents The Candidates, a presidential town hall meeting series where the presidential candidates of the six leading political parties tell us about their plans for the country. Join Kadaria Ahmed as she leads us into the world of these candidates from the 17th to the 23rd of November 2022. This very important program will be streamed on FRCN, Radio Now, DSTV, NTA, Facebook, YouTube, and more. This is a town hall meeting you shouldn't miss. Tune in. Let's hear from the candidates. Choosing where to study is one of the biggest decisions you will make in life. So, it is important to get it right. At Coal City University in Ugu, Nigeria, we pride ourselves on providing students a stable academic calendar and education of international standards. Coal City University gives students incredible personal attention and support. You can enroll in our regular programs and obtain a degree exclusively awarded by Coal City University. Alternatively, you can enroll in our International Pathway programs, which will enable you to earn two degrees in four years from Coal City University and Delaware State University, United States. Visit www.ccu.edu.ng. Welcome back. You are watching The Candidate, where we're in conversation with Dr. Rabiu Musa Konkoso, the presidential candidate of the NNPP. And I'm pleased to say we have also been joined by Bishop Idahosa, the vice presidential candidate of the same party. Thank you, sir, for Thank finding so the much. time. I understand you'd gone away on assignment and you rushed to come back to join I us. rushed to come back, but then the delay was caused due to VIP movement. Right. Um, that phrase <laughs> that we don't like hearing. Okay, we'll come to you and ask a few things in a minute, but I just I want to um, allow um, Dr. Konkoso to respond to a few questions that were asked out of the University of Ibadan just before you joined us. So the questions around comments that were uh, made by you, 
quoted by the student around the Igbos and the issue of federal character, whether you think by contesting, you're essentially guaranteeing if you win, we're going to end up with a lopsided arrangement where the North would have led for much longer than the southern part of the country. Those were the two questions. Okay, thank you very much. You see, I don't want to go into the arithmetic and uh, argument of how many presidents we have uh, from the north or from the south. But um, I know that uh, if you add, if you go by that argument from 1999 to 2022 now, you can see which part of the country had more years than the other. But that's not my argument. The argument is that uh, we have a party the NNPP, which uh, has been strengthened, populated, and of course uh, now is very much on the ground. And party, you see, the, 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 the idea of who becomes a presidential candidate is purely a political party affair. And it goes with strategy, of course, to win the election. Many people in this country believe that uh, the situation has gone so bad to the extent that people are looking for the best. In fact, I met somebody who was telling me, and I believe that's an extreme, that if you can go and hire somebody from somewhere outside this country, <laughs> that, that is probably an extreme uh, thinking, to come and fix Nigeria. He, would be very happy. So you can now see how people are thinking. So the issue now is we found ourselves in this situation and people are looking for an answer. That's in terms of who is the best candidate. And we believe in NNPP that the candidates of our party are the best. And of course, we are talking of the candidates of the presidency and of course, Vice President, we believe this combination is the best, well-balanced uh, ticket, and we are all committed to uh, 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 one Nigeria, a Nigeria that will work for each and every one of us, not minding your religion, not minding North or South, not minding your ethnicity, and so on and so forth. Now, we had an opportunity in the past we have proved it in Kano. The scholarship the, 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 the gentleman was talking about, we have in almost all, the, all states today, you have people who have gone abroad. I'm not talking of local scholarship mm. in the name of Kano. And it was deliberate, we knew, because we believe that where you are is your home. Okay. If you come from any part of the country and you are living in Kano, we believe that's your home. Okay, so let me, let, that, this issue of um, the fact that people really, in reality, want to come to them, and that I mean, a united Nigeria that works for all is what the NMP, NMPP stands for. Nonetheless, Bishop Idahosa, you cannot deny the fact that there is seemingly, seems to be a lot of fracturing, whether deliberately um, politicians again and again have exploited our fault line, whether that is ethnicity, whether that is religion, to the extent that these things now are becoming a recurring decima every time we have elections. And there are those who argue that we're very fractured. So how does the NMPP intend to unite Nigeria in real practical terms? In real practical terms, it's all about leadership. Where you find what drives the system is on the wheel of transparency, justice, equity, fairness, inclusivity, and trust is built. Once trust is built, things will begin to run their course. But you see, when we have selfish people, greedy people, who are not lovers of the country, they accumulate so much, and that's where you find the lopsidedness in nepotism, Mm. where people don't observe fair character. They 
And they always will think they'll be there forever. They are not. The God factor is a big factor. When you fear God in leadership and able to say what you want to do and then surround yourself with people who will tell you the truth, it doesn't matter whose ass is gone, then Nigeria will be a better place for everyone. Let's go to a few of our remote sites because we're running fast out of time and it's really important that we get all the six sites in. Um, can we connect to University of Meduguri, please? Hello, good evening, Nigeria. Uh, this is Musa Osman from the campus of University of Meduguri, uh, live. We have been following the conversation taking place between Kadria and uh, Senator Ravi Musa Kokoso and his running mate that has just joined us. It has been very interesting and the students here have been following the discussions. We have a couple of questions from two students, uh, Ifai and Yasu. Ifai. Good evening, sir. Please, I have two questions to ask you. The first is on education. So I want to know, because it's unarguable that education is the lifeline of every nation. And we've been ravaged with several strikes, particularly the tertiary arm of uh, the education system. So how do you think, how do you intend to curb this menace of in-season strike, particularly in Nigerian tertiary institutions? And also, how do you intend to boost and take away um, the out of school to take back the out of school children that's primary secondary because they are also the foundation a very important uh, uh, stage of education now my second question although someone from Ibado has uh, briefed on it but I, that would not stop me to still ask you it's about Nigerian unity sir on the issue of Nigerian unity how do you intend to bring together and include every region in your government in terms of appointments, allocations, physical infrastructural development, because some of the separatist agitators have claimed that it is because of the non-inclusion in governance, particularly from the federal level, that is making them to agitate or to separate from the country. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next, we take the question from Yasser. Yasser? Good evening, sir. My name is Mohammed Yasser Gerba from the Department of Mass Communication. Uh, sir, according to the report, Korea source TV's uh, hints since the reunion near us this year. So, and the Nigerian government making move uh, to phase out the subsidy. So, sir, are you in support? Uh, if not, what plans do you have in order to address the issue in favor of Nigerians and the Nigerian economy? And the second question, sir, you make a statement that. Uh, you left the board of NDDC because you did not like what was happening there. So, sir, can you shed more light about that? Thank you very oh, much. Yeah, that's what we have from thank, thank, you. thank you very much. And I think it's important to remind the um, students and other people who are sending in questions to try not to repeat questions. Because, you know, time is limited. If one person has already asked a question and he has tried to answer it, let's not please go back to it. I will add one question from someone who's just sent it in online, and then you can take them all. This is from um, Sabiu Mustafa. He says, Your Excellency, sir, what would you do to curtail the issue of everyday hyperinflation, which we see in the country? Because low-income earners, especially civil servants, are paying a very high price as a result. So these are your questions. Thank you very much. Now, um, the... Young men from my degree, I thought uh, you should start by acknowledging our effort in the university. You know, when I was governor, we selected uh, four universities, uh, Al-Kalam University, Ahmad Bella University. Um, in fact, uh, uh, my degree, uh, my degree as Sokoto, Usman Damfodio University, I'm built. 300 bed host, uh, hostel free of charge and donated to that university. And I'm sure that is there as Concorsia uh, hostel mm. in his university. But in any case, uh, just to show how much we care about education, my degree and all the other three universities were not in Kano, 
but we thought because of our students that are there, we should donate those hostels, and we did. And uh, let me go to the issue of strife. You see, we checked with ASU on why they were on strike. In fact, why they were going to strike long before now. And I can tell you, most of the time when ASU was on strike in the country, our branch in Kano was taking permission not to go on strike hmm. because they believe that all what was necessary for us to do as government, we were doing it. And we are so happy, we are so grateful to the uh, ASU branch in Kano who were working together with us as a family. But maybe now, the things have say, changed now. The things that they no, are whether they change or not, in the same country, in the same idea. I'll tell you so why on. I said but it's in, changed. Of the seven things, for example, that ASU are demanding and why they are going on strike, it includes, for example, the fact that they want the federal government to scrape the law that allows for new universities to be built Is and to actually enough? focus on funding existing universities. You set up new Is universities. There in our blueprint, yeah. which yes. you said you read. I did. You see, our blue blueprint was very clear mm. that our government will not be in a hurry to build any new in yes. university. We were going to concentrate on strengthening our existing universities. Mm because we felt it was very critical. No, you, you needed to clarify, us. because earlier you had talked about building new universities. I have read your blueprint. No, the people no, no, watching no, no. Can show have not. I, will somebody, you know I can ask I mean. somebody to show you. What we said is very clear. Posters, huh? maybe accommodation. Yes, maybe no, no, I'm not. I'm saying we're having a conversation that many people have not read your manifesto. That's My job is that. to bring it out so that That's you can explain. That's why I'm bringing it out now. Yes. That's why I'm saying in our blueprint, we made it clear that our administration would not be in a hurry to establish new university or any tertiary institution, mm. but will be in a hurry to make sure that all what ASU was saying is in line with also our belief that as at today, we have enough universities and other tertiary institutions. What we don't have is the level of uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, quality in terms of uh, and that size that we are going to improve every sector, every part of our universities, ranging from laboratories to workshops to hostels. Okay. Uh, I think we spent homes. enough time on education because I'm looking at the clock and there are a whole lot of other questions. So should we move to the next one on okay. subsidy? Yes, and out of school children, I mentioned it. Uh, appointment Nigeria, I mean, unity of Nigeria. Of course, we have all friends from all over who are qualified to be appointed into our government. Of course, that's the only way you can have peace. And uh, even to you yourself to have peace in mind, you need to go for uh, every part of the country in terms of appointments. Now, oil subsidy. It's a big problem. It's a big issue. And we have seen it. All of us are aware of the level of corruption that is happening in that sector. And that's the first place of all. Stop the corruption. Make sure that every leader... But they that... say a corruption fights back. So how will you stop no, the no, corruption? No, 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 no. We've fought corruption over the years. You know, if you see corruption fighting back, probably your hands are also not uh, clean. So uh, we have been fighting corruption over the years. And that was why we had all the money we required for uh, projects and programs in all the opportunities that we had. The issue of uh, NDDC, what happened, is exactly this uh, issue of uh, people taking money left, right, and center. But what you was did was you didn't dis stay and fight and clean it up. No, you no, left. No, no, no. What I did was just write a letter and politely tell the president in the letter that so many things were happening, and I went and told him. And of course, uh, at that time, probably he didn't understand. But at the end of the day, uh, he accepted. He said, give me your replacement. I told him that, sir, this place has these issues you want to meet. He said, yes, give me a replacement. He insisted. I said, okay. 
as a president, I have to give you, I give him my party chairman at that time. Okay. I can tell you, few months after, yes. the whole board has to be dissolved. Okay, and talking about NNDC, Bielsa is on standby. Let's hear what they have to say. Hello, Victor. Welcome to Bielsa State. Uh, it's been very interesting listening to Senator Rabi Okwakwanso, and we have um, two people that want to ask questions. I'll call on Belasai first, and Dressman will be on cue. Yeah, good evening, sir. Um, my name is uh, Pelesai Desmond. Uh, my name is uh, Pelesai Desmond, and um, I'm an economist. I would like to ask you a very important question. Uh, considering the fact that uh, the Nigeria economy depends on this uh, crude oil, and up to date, our refineries are not actually working. And uh, I find it somehow uh, bad. Actually, I want to ask, I want to know your opinion on this uh, modular refinery, which is the Bunkery Oil. I want to know if you are in support of it or not, because way back, this our recent uh, flood, I will tell you that, that uh, uh, Baesa actually we patronize this, this uh, crude oil product. Instead of we patronize this crude oil product and uh, it help us, and I will tell you that this product is actually up to 80 to 90 percent good compared to the normal fuel that we uh, take, we use from the police station. Thank you very much. Okay, the next person is um, Dressman. I would like him to ask his question quickly. Yeah, Dressman Dinepre is my name from uh, the Department of Philosophy, Nanja Delta University. Your Excellency, my question is on overflooding. Overfl overflooding has become a recurring decimal in the southern <coughs> states. And uh, if you become the president of this country, what practical steps, knowing that neighboring countries are releasing water from their dams to this country that is causing the overflooding in the country. What will you do to mitigate or solve the problem of flooding in this country if you are elected as the president of this country? Thank you, Your Excellency. Okay, thank you very much, Kaderia. That's it from uh, Thank you, Victor. And let's go straight to the University of Abuja because we have about just 15 minutes. I'd like to get all the remote sites in. And then um, we come back to the candidates to round up. The University of Abuja, please. If University of Abuja is not ready, I'll come back to the candidate. Abuja is not. Let's shout. <laughs> <laughs> I can see them, so I don't understand why we can't hear them. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay, good evening, Kaderia. Thank you for joining us here at the University of um, Abuja. Um, quite an engaging conversation there. The students actually have a bunch of questions, but because of time, we'll just take two questions. I'm starting with uh, Mansur. Mansur, please go ahead with your questions. Stand up. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mansur Abdullahi from the Department of Microbiology. Um, sir, if by chance you are the president of Nigeria today, my question is how do you intend on resolving the issue of IPOB in the southeast? And then the second question I have is how do you intend to resolve the issue of girl child education and early marriage, which is rampant, especially in the north? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Mansur. The second person is um, Lukman. Lukman? Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. My name is Lukman Zukulai Temitayo from the Department of Animal Science. I thought my question goes thus. If you are being intended as Nigerian president, how do, how do the candidates intend to curb the minors of unemployment and ensure that students after leaving school are equipped with the right skills to ensure that they are, empl they are employable and their job for them? Thank you very much. Um, you know, we are on the NTA. The nine o'clock news is sacrosanct. 
they will not allow us to okay. go beyond that time. So to recap the questions quickly, and if we could have short, short answers, modular refineries and how the people of Bayelsa sort of use them and they're very useful, the issue of overflooding, how to deal with IPOB, early marriage, and how to give people skills to ensure that they're employable. Thank you very much. Now, you see, on the issue of refineries, I remember when I was in the cabinet, we took a decision at that time, after a lot of studies, that these four refineries should be sold to Nigerians, very, very serious and serious uh, Nigerians who would uh, take over and, of course, run them uh, privately so that at the end of the day, government can benefit from taxes and so on. And that and is still the at position. At that particular time. But unfortunately, the uh, administration that came in decided not to sell it. And only well, would you do that? God, God knows how much money this country would have lost in this number of years. Of course, we have to involve our businessmen and women. And we have to keep our eyes everywhere to make sure that whatever we do is not only in the interest of individuals or group of few people. So we will do whatever it takes. Now we know the uh, Dangote refinery is coming on board. We will do whatever it takes to encourage them uh, so that uh, it becomes a success because its success is not only the success of the businessman Flood. or woman who are there, but the success of this country. The issue of overflooding. You see, there are so many problems. It's not only in the south that we have overflooding in this country. In fact, we have a lot of overflooding or flooding when I was governor, and that was why we built so many villages and donated those houses free of charge, meaning we moved out so many villages that were in low-lying areas, especially in Warawa local government, in Makoda local government, in Uchi local government, even my own local so government. So will you do whole-scale movement so, of people? You see, first and foremost is that so many people, in some cases, are building in low-lying areas. Government must look at that. Government must move as many people as possible uh, out. But there are, there are situations where you have a lot of rain and you have a lot of issues in many of our rivers. Don't forget. I am not trying to be rude, sir. But I promise you, if I don't hurry you up, you will not be able to answer all okay. questions. Now, um, I pop. we'll work with nearby or neighboring countries okay. to make sure that uh, water being released just like that must be checked with and before I, I, I forget, I have to remind you also that this is my area of specialization. Yes. That's why I had my PhD in all these movements of water and so on. The issue of IPOP, IPOP and all other people who are agitating for one thing or the other, we made it clear even in our blueprint. We will be willing to sit down with everybody and discuss. Where you Will have you release Nam Kanu if you become president as part of Where we have genuine case. The issue is in the court. I don't think we should start discussing it now uh, in this place. So we'll do whatever it takes to ensure that those who are agitating will come and put it on the table and make sure that uh, the right thing is done. The issue of girl child and early marriages and so on. You see, once you have everybody going to school, most of these issues will resolve themselves. We have seen it in Kano, and at the end of the day, we are able to do a lot to ensure that every child goes to school. Now, finally, the issue of unemployment. Yes, all what we are going to do, I'm sure the young men and women must have heard the issue of one million soldiers, one million police, uh, of course, expanding our universities, uh, providing infrastructure for companies, for I'll give you, I'll and give so you on. a minute to round up at the end, but let me quickly ask Bishop one question before we go. Currently, the Nigerian constitution doesn't have provisions for a referendum for people who perhaps decide they do not want to be part of Nigeria. 
Um, what's the position of the party regarding the people's right to self-determination? Once you are in government, would you be willing to consider um, uh, uh, some sort of constitutional review that allows people to, to go to referendum to decide whether they want to remain with Nigeria or not? Well, you see, uh, the unity of this country is very paramount. But then the wishes of people too will be put on the table. And it depends on what the House of Assembly has to bring about because it's going to be a law governing country. And so whatever they come with that suits the generality of the people is what we're on with. Okay. A final question. And after you've answered it, if you can wrap up and talk to Nigerians directly and tell them why they should um, uh, vote for you once more, right? There are people who think you're a spoiler. Because you've gone on a rise to say that if you don't win these elections or if you think you can't win this election, then you will endorse Asiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. And therefore, they think that uh, the reason you are contesting is to take away votes from your former party, um, the PDP, and to perhaps help Asiwaju win these elections. How do you respond? And when you respond, then you can also I... wrap up. I thought that matter was being buried. I had an interview, like all others, my colleagues in the game, PDP, APC, uh, Labour, all SDP, they are all our brothers and sisters and so on, and we all know ourselves. I'm not in a business of abusing anybody. But if you make a positive statement on somebody, and people taking it, the young men and women probably on social media, and uh, some people who really don't understand, who, who feel that suits them, will always and go and say it. If I will, uh, you know, say that I will leave it for one of them or any one of them, then why am I in this game? Look, this NNPP today has more contestants, candidates, than most of these parties, even among the two uh, uh, so-called uh, old parties. So, you see, we are very serious about it. And today, I was reading uh, some papers. Even INEC is preparing for second uh, ballot. Now, why? Because serious people are in the game. To the extent that it is even thinking today, unlike what happened from 1999 to date, that there may be second ballot. So if ballot. there's a second and ballot you, and you're not on that ballot, let me tell you, will let you me support tell you, a candidate? Let me tell you clearly. I agree with them today. But give us till January next year. You will see what we can call the real party in this country. We started from the bottom, from zero, and we are building. Now they are putting us among the four. Sometimes they put one picture or the other before our own. Let me tell you, just for the records, take note of it. Wait and see what happens between now and January. You see all the so-called three parties. They are losing grip. Yeah, it's just, it's just, and there is nothing, absolutely nothing any of them will do to change this trend coming down. It's only the NNPP whose graph is going up. And you see, our trends is not based on the so-called big, big names and so on. We are going to the grassroots. The way we are playing it is so sophisticated, is so, is such that nobody can go and change the trend now because people have accepted. People are looking for positive change, especially those who know us. Either directly, people are saying Northwest, Northern Nigeria, yes. even the Southern Nigeria now, because our main job now is for Nigerians to know us and know what we stand okay, for. And last few words, 30 seconds, Bishop Idahosa. The young man talked about inflation. We are going to improve on productivity. We are going to ensure that there will be diversification into agriculture so people are able to find themselves. We will consume what we produce and produce what we consume. We will ensure that people patronize made in Nigerian goods. That way we are going to stop capital, capital flights whereby people siphon our resources abroad. We are going to cut the cost of governance. We are going to block leakages. I wish you had been here a little where, bit earlier so oh you could God. have told me the how. Yeah. As it is now, unfortunately, we I have, have the how. Can I break them? We have run out oh of time. Word.
And that's it for the candidates for today. I apologize to people in the room who had a lot of questions to ask, and also the students who joined us from six remote locations because a few of them also wanted to talk a bit more and we had to cut them short. A few people also sent questions via social media that we could not take. I do apologize. Thank you so much, you. Uh, Senator Kwankwaso and Bishop Idahosa for joining us on The Candidate. Tomorrow, you can join us for our Pundit Show, moderated by our very own Nabila Usman. Our commentators will review the three concluded town halls and also the three upcoming ones, starting with the one on Monday, when we'll be in conversation with Mr. Peter Gregory Obi and Dr. Deti Ahmed of the Labour Party. We want to thank the MacArthur Foundation for making this conversation possible and also our partners, NTA, Cabal Entertainment, Silverbird Television, FRCN, Radio Now, News Central, YouTube, Citizen Zikoko, Emmanuel Chapel, and all of you who joined us for this town hall. Have a wonderful evening. Daria Media, in association with Cabal Entertainment, presents The Candidates. A presidential town hall meeting series where the presidential candidates of the six leading political parties tell us about their plans for the country. Join Kadaria Ahmed as she leads us into the world of these candidates from the 17th to the 23rd of November 2022. This very important program will be streamed on FRCM, Radio Now, DSTV, NTA, Facebook, YouTube and more. This is a town hall meeting you shouldn't miss. Tune in. Let's hear from the candidates.